All righty. Thank you all for joining after lunch. Um, it's my pleasure to uh, present this afternoon's session on our work deploying in RDM as an institutional repository platform for data, software, and publications. I'm Tom Morell. I'm the research data specialist at Caltech Library. Uh, my background is actually in computational chemistry. Um, so I was a researcher um, before I joined the library seven years ago to help with um, institutional data and software management. Um, and that really helps me focus the, the services that we provide to really meeting the researcher's needs. Um, and I'm going to be talking all about the work that we've done uh, bringing up our data and software repository platform. Um, the slides are available on Zenodo, so you can grab the, the DOI at the bottom of the slides now, um, or you can just search and find the slides afterwards. So I wanted to start with a little bit of context about Caltech, because it's a, it's a little bit of a weird place. So it has a big scientific impact. There's been 46 Nobel Prizes associated with the Institute. Uh, we manage a lot of large facilities, including the Jet Propulsion Lab, the Palomar and Keck Observatories, and we co-manage LIGO. At the same time, we're really small. Um, there's only 300 faculty, 1,000 undergraduates, 1,400 graduate students. It's like a liberal arts college managing very large scientific experiments. And that makes the library also a little bit unique. We're, we're a small group but we have a really big impact. So we've run institutional repositories since 2001. We've got over 100,000 items. Um, I wanted at this point to acknowledge some of the folks that helped uh, make this project possible. So from the Digital Library Group, um, we've got Robert Doyle, uh, who helped with all of our authentication, Tommy Keswick, who did our theming and CSS work, Mike Kaka, who helped with the GitHub integration, and our fearless leader, Stephen Davison, uh, who's also here. And then on the Invineo RDM migration team, uh, we have Kathy Johnson, who did a lot of the VOR mapping, which I'll talk about a little bit later. George Porter, who manages Caltech authors and that massive collection of content. And Tony Diaz, who helped a lot with our data cleanup and testing. Um, I'm going to start with what I spend most of my time with, which is Caltech data. So Caltech data is our institutional repository uh, for Caltech researchers to upload data sets and software. The reason we wanted our own uh, data repository was we really wanted to make it easy for researchers to deposit their content. We know there's a, a ton of really valuable research data sitting on researchers' laptops, on lab servers, and if we don't get that content into a format that we can actually preserve and use, it's just going to get lost. And we wanted to make sure that this was as easy as possible for researchers to reduce their burden. It's also really helpful for compliance with publisher mandates as well as funder mandates for sharing both data and software. We started in 2017, um, and it's been really successful. So we've got over 26,000 records, over 10 terabytes of data in storage. Um, the vast majority of the records have been automatically generated with our API. We're basically automatically transferring in records and files. Um, but we do have a significant amount of software that have been generated from our GitHub integration, as well as um, you know, individual single one-off deposits where researchers come to our deposit form, upload their files, describe them. And we've had submissions there from over 6% of our campus users. So we've gotten a pretty broad base of submissions. Um, what types of things do we have? We have kind of the traditional data of a big sheet of numbers. We also have software. Um, we have simulation results. Um, we have stuff that doesn't fit in other places. So we actually have a lot of early AI vision training data sets, like this data set from the, the Mars yard at JPL. Um, we have cases where the photos themselves are the research objects, in terms of this, uh, this set looking at some rock samples. And then we have images that are almost art. So this is a, a, a map um, of Titan, where they pulled in different data sets and generated this really pretty map. And we've also got um, three-dimensional data, like this mouse femur. So we've got all sorts of data sets from all sorts of disciplines, all types of data. And it's all stuff that wouldn't fit into a traditional um, domain repository. So you really need a, a, a generalist type repository environment uh, to be able to collect this content. 
So what were we looking for in a repository? Uh, the initial version of Caltech Data was inspired by uh, Zenodo. So we worked with a, a hosting provider, and we said, you know, we really want the self-deposit and the, the ease of use that we see with, with Zenodo. And fortunately, because Zenodo is open source software, we were able to actually basically grab the code and then modify it for our needs. Um, again, the key feature was it's easy for researchers to go in, describe, and upload their files. And philosophically, the researchers are the ones that are in control of their records. So from the library side, we're able to help so make suggestions and improvements, but it's really the researchers' data, the researchers' records, they're the ones that are responsible um, for describing accurately what work they've done and what files they're uploading. All the records get DOIs. Um, and we had an integration with GitHub where you can pull software down automatically, as well as an API for accessing data, and that was really critical um, for a lot of the integrations that I'll talk about later on. And the thing was that lots of other institutions had this same idea. They're like, oh, we want to have an institutional version of Zenodo. And because the code is open, they said, oh, we'll go grab the code and we'll modify it. The problem with that is then you have 20 or 30 or 40 different forks of Zenodo. And it's basically impossible for everyone to update, uh, make contributions to the same source code base if everyone has their own little fork. And so we realized this was a problem, and this uh, spawned the idea of, of Invineo RDM. So there's currently, I think, 26 Invineo RDM partners that all have this same use case. They want um, a repository that's like Zenodo, but for their institution. Um, and what features does it have out of the box? So it's built on the Invineo repository platform. So it's Python-based which is really nice for development. It's, again, inspired by Zenodo, but it's designed to be customizable. So like theming, you can really easily theme stuff. Um, things like vocabularies, you can really easily customize, and I'll talk about that in a little bit more detail later on. It is designed around data and software. So it, it's Bones, it's a data and software repository, but it does support all item types. And if you look at Zenodo, they actually have a large amount of traditional journal publication type content. Um, Caltech Data was an early migration, so we had a, a contractual reason that we had to move. Um, so we were, we were early, particularly for a large repository. Zenodo itself will be migrating this fall. Um, so what do you get out of the box with Invineo RDM? You get that user-friendly deposit form. Again, we want it to be easy for researchers to, to participate in this process. Um, I'm going to talk through some of the big features of the deposit form, but really the best thing to do is for you to try it out yourself. So if you go to Invineo Web or InvineoRDM.web.cern.ch, that's the public test version of Invineo RDM. You can put in whatever email address you want, and it'll allow you to play around with the deposit form. So there's autocomplete in a lot of places that make things easier for researchers. So creators and contributors will autofill from ORCID. Affiliations will autofill with ROARs. You can put in whatever subject vocabularies you want. Um, you can put in award information. So if you have grants that you want to have researchers tag their data sets or software with, you can put those in. Uh, funders are identified with ROAR identifiers. Um, we have that drag and drop file uploads. It's really easy to add files into the system. You as an administrator control what the file restrictions are how many files you want to allow users to add, what the, how much at size you want. We have automatic DOI registration. So when that record is published, a DOI is automatically minted. Um, we spend a lot of time making sure that all the metadata in Invineridium goes to data site. Um, so we've got a really nice platform for managing the DOIs. Um, you can do draft records. So basically, researchers can start filling out a record, save it to their workspace, and come back to it later. And the other nice out-of-the-box feature are these community record curations. So basically what you can do is you can set up a community, say a research group or a lab or a division. You can identify individuals who are going to be acting as curators for that community. And then researchers can submit their records into that community, and then the curators can review that. So it's basically a self-service uh, curation environment. And it works really well for kind of empowering researchers to figure out uh, how they want to do their, their data management and data curation. 
So how did our migration go? What did we need to do? Well, we needed to move all the 20,000 or so records and files that were in the old version of Caltech data. We had to customize the repository for Caltech, so the theming, putting in stuff like ORCIDs. And most importantly, we had to ensure that the API integrations that we had put together continued to work. So what was our migration strategy? So we really relied on standard data site metadata. And this was something that we had started really early on when we were working with Caltech data. Um, the original kind of tweaked version of Zenodo had a couple of weird things in the metadata schema that we knew we weren't going to continue moving forward. And so what we did is we built some tooling for transforming the internal schema that was used uh, to standard data site metadata. And we were able to basically export out all the records, validate that that metadata was correct, and then put it back in. And so we had already, when we decided we were going to migrate to Nvidia RDM, we'd already gone through the process of validating that, yes, we could pull out all of our metadata and all of our files. So we basically did that. We had an export of everything. We then imported records into Nvidia RDM using the API. So uh, this is not the only way you can get records into the system. Um, so if you're Zenodo and have two million records, um, there are faster ways of doing it. Um, but this was really useful for us because it allowed us to validate that the API used for generating records would work for everything we had in the collection and it was behaving as we expected. And once everything was moved over, we then switched. We swapped our domain name to the new version of our new RDM. Um, as usual, it takes a little while for the single sign-on stuff to get configured correctly. Um, but generally, for our users, there wasn't a significant change. Um, they, all their records were as they were before, um, and they could easily generate new records. Um, during the migration process, we did some metadata enhancements. Um, so raw identifiers didn't exist uh, when Caltech data started. There wasn't really a, there wasn't a place for them in the system. Um, so we took the opportunity of the migration to do some enhancements. So we started with an automated mapping from our affiliation strings to raw identifiers using um, the raw retriever from metadata game changers, followed by manual validation. And that manual validation step, having a human in the loop, is really important because uh, short affiliations like JPL don't automatically map particularly well, uh, as well as, you know, you'll have lots of national institutes of health. Which one is the correct one? Um, you kind of need to have a little bit more context to be able to make that decision. We also uh, mapped and split free text affiliations. So in the old version of Caltech data, we didn't have the ability to do kind of multiple affiliations per contributor. Um, so we were able to go in in cases where people had had multiple affiliations in the same field, we were able to split those up and map those to ROARs. We also mapped funders uh, into ROAR, and we did minor cleanup like splitting subjects. Even though we had multiple, we had the ability to do individual subjects, people really liked putting in subjects separated by semicolons and commas. So we cleaned all that up. You can take a look at what we did in terms of the migration. Our scripts are up on GitHub. We also had to do theming. And as I said, Nvidia RDM is designed to allow you to theme it. So we made the front page look exactly like we wanted with our orange everywhere. Uh, we get theming on the landing pages. So that is really nice for identifying where you are. Um, and even stuff like the login page. This is actually where Tommy spent most of his time uh, figuring out how to get the, how to kind of direct people to our single sign-on while still allowing people to use local logins if needed. Um, the other thing that we were able to implement as part of our migration was our, our Celtic people list. So this is a, a, a prior library-wide effort to identify what people are associated with Caltech and what their ORCIDs are. So this is useful for a whole bunch of things. It powers our metadata service uh, feeds, which is basically an aggregated view of the metadata in our repositories, which is useful for stuff like faculty websites and reporting. But since we already had this vocabulary, we were able to add it in Nvidia RDM as a, as a name vocabulary. And what that enables is then if you're adding a creator to a record, you can start typing somebody's name. And if it's in the system, it will automatically say, oh, this is, this is probably the person you're talking about. Once you click that person, it auto fills in uh, their family and given name, their ORCID, their affiliation, which has a roar in the back end of it. 
So it makes it really easy to add people uh, to records. <clears throat> I want to spend most of my time talking about what we do with APIs. And the, three, the three ones I'm going to talk about are the Cell Atlas, TCON, and Micropublication. We actually did a CNI um, digital briefing um, that covers um, some of this in more detail. So if you find this interesting, go check out the digital briefing. So the Cell Atlas is a really cool book publication online project. It's an open access textbook on the microbial cell. And so it's really neat interactive. There's over 150 videos with text and narration. There's uh, overlay sliders, 3D protein structures. It's a really cool uh, way of looking at um, cells. Um, for this audience, the important thing is that the videos and other media that make up this site um, are stored in Caltech data. And all those records were automatically created with the Caltech data API. So when we migrated, we had to make sure that all that automation still worked. Um, so the 2.4 version release of the Cell Atlas was the first one where we had NVIDIA RDM up and running. And we didn't really have a whole ton of changes to do to make this work. So we had to add raw identifiers, we had to make a couple other minor metadata changes, but basically we ran the script, we uploaded the content, so this is a, a shot of the PDF version in the new version of Caltech Data. And the nice thing is it now has that built-in versioning, so you can look in between the different versions and see what's changed on that right-hand panel. Another uh, API automation that we have is TCON. So this is a consortium of about 29 data collection sites around the world. They're looking at solar spectra and back calculating concentrations of small molecules. All those data files come to Caltech for data curation and processing. And once they're ready, they get uploaded to Caltech data um, for public access. And this is a migration we did a, a while back. These were previously going up to Oak Ridge National Lab. So the automation steps that we need are a monthly update. So every month we say, okay, what data can we release to the public? We pull in the metadata, generate the files, and upload that in Caltech data. We also have to deal with a new revision. So these are, these are NetCDF files, they're time series files. Generally, they're just adding new data to the end of it. But if they have to go back and reprocess data, we then have to generate a completely new version. So we basically use the built-in versioning in Infinity RDM to say, okay, now we're going to do a new version, put new files, um, and I'll show you what that looks like in a second. We finally have, sometimes we get new sites that are joining the consortium, and that's just a completely general, uh, complete, completely new record um, with, with new metadata. So we have these three automation processes that we need to make sure would work, um, and they do. And they actually, we've gotten some improvements in Infinity RDM. So the first is that we actually now have a community landing page for TCON. Uh, this is also available on their website because they like to format it the way they like. But it's nice to know there's a native view of this in our repository. There's also now support for automatic versioning. So on the right, you can see an example of a record where there's been a new release. And so the versions are now listed in that right-hand panel. And there's also a warning at the top that says, hey, you're looking at an old version of this record. There's a new version, that's really the one that you should look at. We were kind of doing this manual in the old version of Caltech data, so it's nice that this is now completely automated. Uh, the final API integration is Micropublication Biology. Um, so this is a really cool, innovative journal that's published at Caltech. Um, and they focus on single findings. So not full papers, just one single piece of information, kind of one, maybe one figure or one panel of a figure from a traditional publication. And these can be novel findings or they can be negative findings, so something that you thought was going to work and didn't, or it can be a, a reproduction of something, a finding that somebody else had. And it often lacks kind of the overall narrative that you need for a traditional publication. So you can basically just say, here is this piece of data, I trust it, but I don't really know what it means in the context of a whole organism or something like that. Um, these are peer-reviewed, and they've got a really nice peer review platform that they manage. Um, the cool thing for me as a, as a data person is all the data files are automatically uploaded to the appropriate partner repositories. So they look at, you know, is it is a nematode? Is it a xenophos? Is it a fly? And they put those data files in the right format 
and send it to the appropriate domain repositories. So it's a, it's a really cool innovative publishing model. Um, where it comes in context of Caltech data is for supplemental files that don't map to one of those um, disciplinary repositories. So software or CSV files. Um, Micropublication uses Caltech data for those files. And this is offered as part of our library publishing services. So we also offer things like DOI minting, help with indexing. And so this uh, kind of supplemental data management is just part of our normal publishing services. And this is completely automated using the Caltech data API. Unlike the, the two previous examples that I talked about, um, the micropublication team implemented this independently. So basically I sent them the API documentation and they're like, okay, we got it, no problem. And a couple days later, they had records flowing into Caltech data. So this kind of indicates the general usefulness and success of these APIs because we can have independent teams just work off of the documentation and send in records. And so we were successfully able to complete our migration. So we moved all of our content by our contract deadline. We got everything over. Everyone was happy. Um, all the API integrations that I talked about continue to work. And we got out of this by moving to Nvidia RDM really significant improvements to the landing pages as well as the automatic versioning that I talked about. Um, GitHub support is coming soon, um, so that we'll hopefully have in the next couple of months. Um, and now I want to talk about what's coming next for, for Caltech Library and our repository systems. Um, so I mentioned Caltech Authors at the beginning. It is our large institutional repository, so it has over 100,000 works um, by Caltech Authors. And these get a lot of use. Um, so we have an organic chemistry textbook, which is the number two Google hit for organic chemistry PDF. It has over, a, it's had over a million downloads. Same with our, our textbook on chemical reaction engineering and a rate of change solution. So we get a lot of use of this content and it shows the real value of hosting this content as an institution. Um, at the same time, this content has been hosted in ePrints since 2004. So it's a, that's a long time for a repository system to, to survive. Um, you know, we've done upgrades and stuff, but it's, um, I went to the Wayback Machine to look at a, a 2004 version of a landing page in Caltech Authors. Um, and you can compare it to the current version of the landing page and it looks remarkably similar. It's the same little PDF logo, the same order of metadata. Um, it hasn't changed all that much in 20 years. So the exciting thing that we're working on is migrating all of this content to Nvidia RDM. Um, it's gonna be a big lift, it's a lot of records. We have to customize all the, we have to capture all of the customized metadata that's been captured over the last 20 years. And we also have to fully redirect all the old URLs because we get a lot of traffic to the old URL paths. Um, but it will hopefully allow us to build much more automation for record creation utilizing APIs. And that's something that we just can't easily do in ePrints. So where are we at? We're working through this. We're doing lots of customization. One example are resource types. So we've worked through all the resource types that come out of the box from Nvidia RDM, all the resource types that are in ePrints, and we're also adding new ones. For example, I showed you how important textbooks are um, to Caltech authors. We actually have now added a custom resource type for textbooks so we can separate those out from the rest of the books. And just as a teaser, this is where we're at. We're automatically transferring over records using the API. We're mapping a lot of the metadata. We're not complete yet, but we've got a good chunk of it in place. And as a result, we now get really nice landing pages that have a previewer, that have a citation that you can style. Um, we have identifiers for, not in this record, um, but we'll have identifiers for people and affiliations. It's gonna be really exciting. So be on the lookout for this um, uh, later this year. Um, it's time to wrap up. So in conclusion, Nvidia RDM is a power open, powerful open source platform for institutional repositories. We successfully migrated Caltech data by focusing on standardized metadata. Um, and customized resources can utilize API integrations and that really allows research groups to display and use the data the way that they want to, but allowing the library to really be able to preserve and maintain the actual underlying data files. And we're in the process of migrating all of our uh, library institutional repositories to Nvidia RDM. 
So if you have any questions, feel free to email me. And it looks like we have about five minutes for questions from the audience. So please come up for the microphone and uh, ask me whatever questions you have about our repository work. So this is totally not fair because I know the answer because I work with you, Tom, but if I were sitting out here in the audience and I didn't work with you, I would be wondering about um, the time and staffing levels and that sort of thing that's gone into this because that's the kind of thing that I wonder about when, when other places are talking about the work that, that they're doing. So can you say a little bit about that for us? Sure. Well, as I said, we're, we have a very small library and so we've been able to do this with um, not a ton of staffing. So I'm kind of the primary head on the Caltech data work. And then as I showed in the beginning, we've got a digital library group that helped out with components of it. Um, and then we had a team from across the library, um, particularly with the Caltech office migration, helping with all the metadata work and cleanup and stuff like that. Um, so in my opinion, you can actually run your own NVIDIA RDM repository without a ton of specialized staffing. And there was some discussion early of, earlier of you know, like $75 million budgets for research data services, and we are running uh, Caltech data on a very, very, very minimal fraction of that. <laughs> um, and I think, I think, Kara, that folks can chat with you more if they want more specific numbers. <laughs> I got a question over here. Uh, Matt Mernick. Oh, sorry about that. From the National Center for Atmospheric Research. research. Uh, so thanks for the talk. Could you comment on the GitHub integration a bit more and the software archi archiving part? Is it similar to the Zenodo GitHub plugin, I assume? Exactly, yeah. So what we had in the, or the original version of Caltech Data was exactly what Zenodo has. So it's a, uh, basically you can log in with your GitHub credentials, you check what repos you want to preserve, and then it'll automatically generate the DOI for you. Um, what we're actually going to launch in hopefully a month or two um, is a little bit different. Um, so we're actually going to be launching a, a GitHub action. So basically something that, we'll, you, that you can configure on a per repository basis. Um, and then basically GitHub triggers the push into the repository. Um, and that allows a little bit more, more control over metadata. We've also have been able to pull in a really comprehensive um, code meta and citation.cff mapping. So basically if there's uh, metadata in the repository or in the in the GitHub repository, um, we'll be we are able to pull that out and map that into the NVIDIA RDM schema. Um, so it should have a really should be a really nice clean interface for doing um, software preservation. Thank you. Sorry, hey, Josh from AWS here. I was just curious about the um, size of the infrastructure that you're running. That is an excellent question and one that I didn't get into too detail with. Um, so storage is the big challenge um, for, for us. So um, all of our storage at the moment is on AWS S3. So in NVIDIA RDM, you have the option of having local storage or S3 as the, as the, as the, as the, as the destination for the files. Um, that obviously has costs. So the way that we've managed it to date is we give researchers 500 gigs of free storage, and then we do a chargeback model if researchers want to um, share more files. Um, we are looking at options for um, kind of local hosting for much larger files. We've done a pilot with the Open Storage Network uh, through some Exceed access support um, for the larger files, but that's, that's something that we're really actively working on um, figuring out how we'll manage the, you know, terabyte to petabyte scale data that is floating around campus. Got it. Thanks for that. And then in terms of the compute? The compute, we're, because we're a small repository, um, it's basically set up as a single, um, you know, AWS host, um, EC2 instance. Uh, you can deploy in Veneerdium a whole bunch of ways. There's a, a, a Kubuntu's distribution that CERN uses, and there's a couple of one, other ones that different sites use. But for us, because we're a smaller site, we don't have a whole ton of traffic or a whole ton of users. 
um, a single EC2 instance has worked well for us so far. Got it, that makes sense. And just one more real quick one. How many users would you say you have on average accessing the system maybe per day? Oh, that's a good question. I don't have a, a, uh, a complete number. So in terms of uh, Caltech users, you know, it's in the handful per day because we're a small institution. Now from the data access and download, that's a much larger number. Um, but I don't have, I don't have a good number offhand. I have the numbers, but I just don't have them on the top of my head. Got it. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks so much. Um, that is the end of our time for this session. Um, but because this is the weird half hour session in the hour slot, um, I'm going to hang out around here for a while. I also have Nvidia RDM hex stickers. So if anyone wants hex stickers with Nvidia RDM, just come down and grab some. Uh, thank you all so much for the opportunity.